welcome to another soccer down here 1v1 uh, quarantine edition these days. We're trying to catch up with some different folks who have been part of the show over the years and have an opportunity to check in with somebody that is usually very, very busy at this time of year, and it's hard to, to find some time to catch up. But these days, Tony Annan has a lot of time on his hands. Tony, how you doing? I'm doing okay, and you're right. I have too much time on my hands. This has got to be, I mean, crazy for you because this is the time of year that things are maybe at their peak. I mean, is this one of the busiest times of the year for you usually? Yeah, I mean, obviously the first team started, the USL would have started uh, full-time training, the academy's in full-time, and it's probably the busiest few months of the year, and it's just been crazy to go from, it's gone from zero to 100 so quickly, and now we're just sort of sitting in, in a holding pattern just waiting to see what happens so it's kind of boring <laughs> not to be at the training ground and not to be the hustle and bustle of that um but it's just we have to deal with it it's part of what's going on and everyone has to just get on with it and there are opportunities i think that can be taken with the time um in many different ways but right now it's just like i said sitting and waiting for the league to tell us what's next yeah, it's something I was trying to explain to somebody like about my end of things. As you, know, you mentioned the first team, the USL team all ramping up. It felt like it was this long build with preseason and doing a few preseason games. And then it was three games in five days. And where you know we got the news with all this going down is we're in Mexico City for CONCACAF Champions League. And trying to get ready to do a broadcast with the news about the NBA and everything breaking as we're going. What was it like for you as, as the news started to come out and things were obviously going to start to change, you know, how was it managing that process for the Academy on your end? Um, I think the good news, the good news for us was obviously Matt Lowry, who's a Academy manager. He kind of came into me and said, look, I know you don't think this is serious right now, but in a couple of weeks' time, it's going to be. His mum's in, uh, I think she works for the Disease Control Centre or whatever, um, up in Virginia. But she was kind of giving him updates, and uh, a few friends of mine who work in Italy and uh, Holland um, had already kind of given me the, the brief on what the situa situation was over there. So... Although it came fast, we were kind of prepared. We'd already started preparing our plan B um, for the kids, for what we were going to do with them, how we were going to do it. Um, so we weren't caught off guard, so to speak, but it did. The acceleration of the whole shutdown kind of caught us off guard. We didn't think it was going to be that quick, and obviously for this long. So, you know, right now we're just in a pattern, like I said, but... In preparation for it, we did we did put some things in place. I mean, thanks to Matt and the, his insight, we kind of sort of had a plan a little bit in place before we shut the whole thing just shut down suddenly. I mean, that's, it was like one day it was like, right, no one's allowed back in the training ground. Get your stuff and don't come back until we tell you. So, um, for an academy with the wide range of ages you've been dealing with. How difficult was that to just communicate with the kids and, and also kind of, you know, let them know that, that things are going to be okay on the other end of this? Yeah, I mean, look, we've set up all – all the kids are set up on Google Classroom. So each team has its own classroom where they check in. They've put up – we've put up technical uh, workouts for them. We've put out analysis projects for them. We've uh, asked for self-evaluation stuff from games. So we've put games up there for them. So we're trying to keep them busy. We're trying to keep them engaged. Um, each team head coach is responsible for their classroom. Um, and they keep putting up the projects. I keep sending out messages. I did a few video messages just telling everybody to stay active and try and do their best at this time. Other than that, there's not a whole lot you can do because um, obviously we can't get together. The staff meet on a Wednesday on Microsoft Teams. They, we do a video chat every Wednesday and just discuss where we're at and what the projects are, who's engaged, who's not engaged, what's the plan for the next coming weeks. Um, and just try and keep everybody connected, really. I mean, that's the that's the main goal is just to keep our players engaged who are in their development years, who are going to miss 
you know, it looks like they're going to miss a good month to two months of training. So how do we keep affecting them without being in front of them? It's got to be tough to figure that out on the fly. And I'm sure that as, as you guys have been doing that, all the other academies, not just in MLS, but other professional academies in the U S and, and other clubs in the U S are all kind of figuring this out as they go. Have you been talking to anybody else kind of helping share ideas, best practices, things like that? Yeah. Again, I, I spoke to a lot of guys in the UK cause that's probably where I've got the most contacts. I spoke to wolves. I spoke to Everton, I spoke to Liverpool, I spoke to Newcastle. Um, Got a call this week with Aberdeen, with Gavin, to see what he's doing. Um, but basically, we're all doing the same stuff. I mean, obviously, the guys at Liverpool have so many staff. They have divided their academy into threes and fours, groups of three, groups of four, where we just don't have the manpower to do that. So they're fortunate. They've got so many staff in their academy. They can do that um, and isolate kids in groups of three and four instead of you know 10 and 20 like we have to do. Um, but it's mostly the same stuff, analysis, projects, you know, technical exercises, technical workouts, little challenges, we've set challenges for the kids, not using toilet paper, um, <laughs> which is the popular thing to do this, this, um, the precious commodity for some of us trying to find it. It is apparently, but I, I, a lot of people are using it for, for, for entertainment. So we'll say that, um, <laughs> but the, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've been looking at a lot of the clubs across Georgia and some of them are doing some fantastic stuff. Some of them are doing some really good stuff. Obviously, I don't engage with them as often as I'd like to, um, but I have spoken to quite a few guys in the clubs. I got a call this afternoon with Georgia Soccer, trying to give them some advice and sort of help them through this time as well. But I'm trying to stay engaged with as many people as possible and just see what everyone's doing. But like I said, the clubs in Georgia, I, I, I've been really impressed with some of their homework projects and some of their video stuff they've done. So I think everyone's trying to do their best um, just to get through it and keep the kids active and keep the kids engaged. And right now I'd say we are probably about 95% engaged and some of them have challenges. The families have challenges, obviously, with internet, computers, right. and we've tried to do personal phone calls with everybody once a week just to check in. So each coach will call each kid and just check in, ask the family needs anything medically, you know, more than anything is medically and obviously food if uh, the parents are struggling with their employment. So those are the sort of things we're doing. Um, and it varies from age to age how much we're having them do. Obviously, the 12s are not doing tactical projects, but they're doing a ton of technical projects and challenges. And then as they get older, we add in more and more video and more analysis. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um Again, wish we could do so much more, but it's not easy. How has it been for you to to go from being part of Georgia soccer and and being at different clubs in the Atlanta area to now being with Atlanta United and then passing advice on to the Georgia State Soccer Association and, and being somebody that a lot of the clubs and the state association itself looks to in these kind of moments? Um. I'm 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 okay with the position. I mean, I feel fine with it. I'm happy to help. There's no trade secrets with me. Um, I'm very open, as you know. Um, a lot of the experiences, mistakes, and successes, I'm happy to share. Uh, but I'm comfortable giving everybody any advice they want, whether they take it from me or not. That's that's up to them. But there's been quite a few reached out. There's been quite a few MLS clubs actually reached out as well, just to see what we've been doing. And like I said, at this, these sort of things, there's no secrets. It's just let's share and let's all do the best we can for the game. But it's been, for me, it's been a, a really cool journey, I would say, to be a club coach in the Atlanta area, go through all that, have some successes, have failures, and move into the professional ranks and do quite well with that. And again, I'm not going to end here. I'm not going to, this is not it for me, so... I take privilege that I had the chance to work with a lot of the good people in Georgia, um, in the clubs and in Georgia soccer. And it was a privilege to work with all of them. And I'm not going to forget where I came from. Um, so definitely at times like this, but at any time during the year, I'm comfortable with anybody reaching out to me and telling me or asking me for advice or questions or just even 
feeling feeling what I've done and see if they can learn from that. I get a lot of young coaches on social media who ask me questions and ask if they can speak. And I try not to ignore anybody. I try. I mean, I get a lot, but I've also got a job to do. So I try my best not to ignore any emails or any calls that I get. Yeah, this feels like a time. I mean, you've mentioned it a couple times now that the the game could potentially look a little different at all levels once we, we come out of this. I mean, you've got leagues and competitions and tournaments that have to figure out just what the format looks like to finish the season, let alone what next season looks like. And I was really struck by something that Dietmar Hopp said in Germany and, and talked about how this is a time for solidarity within the game and clubs who might have more means have to help other clubs. Are you starting to get that sense from talking to people in the community that this is a time that maybe the soccer community, whether it's Georgia, whether it's the United States, can come together a bit and try to move forward as a group? You would hope so, right? I mean, you would hope that some clarity comes out of this and some understanding. Um, I think I said at the beginning, given this time that we've got on our hands right now, there are some projects that could be put down on paper, some ideas that could be roughed out to say, look, this will make things better. But again, it takes everybody everybody to be involved, everybody to buy in. Um, I'm a little, little bit sceptical that just because of this, people would change the way they think about leagues and how they want to do their club and how they want to run their club. I don't think we're going to get to that point. Um, but it would be a good time for people to get together online in in chat rooms and just talk about things and try and put some things aside when it comes to what do we want from the game and how do we move it along. I mean, where myself and Matt and a few of the other guys are working on projects for next fall now that we probably wouldn't have attacked until the summer. So taking the time that we've got now to 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 to, to get things in a better place, to have more clarity, to really think about what you've done and how you've done it. Um, I mean, these are the moments when, when you can do that, when you're not consumed by day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day tasks. You can really get some stuff done and be productive with your time, not only as a player, but as a coach. You know, from a coaching perspective, you can really examine your style of play. You can really examine how you deliver your sessions. You can talk to tons of coaches online and get feedback and get ideas. I mean, you could change the way you do things with the time you've been given if you want to and if you feel there's a need. But for me, you never stop learning. You never stop growing. You never, you can never have enough information, good or bad. Um, and that's what I would encourage people to do as much as they can during this time is make you better. You know, you can't work with a team. You can't work with, um, a group of people right now. So why don't you make you better? Try and work on you a little bit and really have a, a good period of self-reflection and change. One thing that's always struck me about Atlanta United's Academy from day one is that it's constantly, I think, been evolving. And, and this year has been setting up to be a huge one. And a big part of that's a player that I've talked to you about for, for years now, but I was so impressed with how George Campbell handled the preseason, handled the minutes he was getting. And then, you know, the last MLS game we saw, he's thrust into that opportunity when Lawrence White goes down and makes the most of it. How, how does that make you feel just watching George Campbell's development from day one in the academy to his MLS debut? Um, I think I've told this story before. I'll probably get Someone will tell me I'll repeat myself because I do as I get older. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. Don't uh, worry about that. Yeah. Um, with George, it's a kind of a special one, right? Because George moved down here from Philly when he was 12, 13. He was very awkward, gangly, tall, you know, not a lot of muscle on him. And he was always picked in tryouts and everything every year at number 16, 17, just making the squad, not playing a whole lot, playing up front, playing as a six never playing at the back. Um, and I said, look, at, at, at U17, he really came on. He grew, his coordination was there, his strength was there. And we put him in the back 
in Mexico and we never looked back from there, so to speak. Um, he was so good and he was so... The potential really showed. Um, but his resilience, his effort, his attitude to keep going when he's sitting on the bench, his attitude to keep going when he was getting reamed by me <laughs> um, for probably unnecessary mistakes and stuff like that. Um, that's why I love George so much. That's why I think he deserves everything he's getting. And if he gets the chance and the boss puts him in games, I think you'll see exactly why I think he's a poster child for what is development. You know, he's worked on it himself. He worked with everybody. He took everything on board. His attitude was spot on. He never missed training. He was always a sub until U17. I mean, he didn't even play in the national final. I mean, that's the crazy part about it. That's he right. didn't participate in that game. And then the never very next year, he's, he's our main guy. So the story to be had is, you know, development is a process. You have to be patient. You have to see things through. You've got to be resilient. You've got to pick yourself up. If you don't have any challenges, you're not going to make it. So for me, that's a long-winded way of saying I'm super proud of George. He deserves everything he's getting. Um and obviously with having a relationship with him for the last five years of his life has really meant a lot to me. Um, so for me, it was a really proud moment to see him step on the field for the first time and handle his business and do it very well. Yeah, he was nervous. There were 72,000 in the building. You know, it was his first game in the MLS. Of course, he's going to make a few errors here and there and look a bit jittery here and there, but I thought he did really well. And given the chance and given a run, George is one of those guys who just grows and grows with confidence. So should the boss give him the chance and give him the opportunities, I think you'll see another Miles Robinson coming out of George Campbell, but earlier. That's the exact comparison that, that I've told people from watching him with the twos last year is it felt like a faster trajectory of what we've seen Miles turn into. George is doing it at a younger age and, and, I think it's a quicker route. You know, he's just advancing step by step by step so much faster right now. That mm -hmm. balance, you mentioned it with, you know, giving a young player an opportunity. And it's always tough because, you know, you, you have to weigh the balances between, you know, a young player is going to make more mistakes than a veteran. But, you know, how hard is it, you know, when you've been in these situations of, finding that balance within a group of giving young players an opportunity, but also, I mean, it's a results driven business. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it's not supposed to be a results driven business at my level. Right. But at the end of the day, we are Atlanta United and we do have a winning mentality in our club. Um, but if you look at our 17s this year, you know, nine out of 11 starters are 2004s in a 2003 age group. And I think that's somewhere I think some that's somewhere we've evolved um, as an academy to give younger players a chance earlier and let them fail and let we will lose games because of it. We'll not do great in J Cup sometimes because some MLS clubs have a full roster of two thousand and threes. Um and we're playing a full roster of O fours almost. So yeah, you're gonna lose games, but at the end of the day, of that 2004 group, we're hopeful two or three of them will make a professional player. And unless we give them the chances, and unless we put them in that situation, they're not going to improve at the rate we need them to. So I think that's where we, we're now starting to start to look at, look, why would we continue with this 2003 player who we know is not going to make it, rather than give the 2004 player a chance who can make it? And I think those are the the ways we're starting to look at things now are winning is not everything. We can win still. Um, but if we really want to produce players, we're going to have to give them a chance and throw them in at the deep end and let them swim. Because they will swim. They will. They'll find their way. They'll make huge mistakes. They'll be encouraged. But at the end of the day, they'll find a way. And that's what it's about, having them find the way. And now you've got another tool in the arsenal as you do this and I, I thought last year it really started to come to the fore how important 
the USL Championship and Stephen Glass's group can be for the academy players coming through. You know, George was a, a prime example, but there were others like Will Riley and now Garrison Tubbs, who, who's in line for a lot of minutes early on in the season. How important is it in that decision-making process for you and for Steven and you know, deciding when a player is ready? What are the things you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, look, Stephen and I have a great relationship, right? We're very, very we're cut from the same cloth as far as football is concerned. So Stephen's very open to listening to me say, hey, what about this guy? What about this guy? Let's give him a chance. Let's let hold let's hold his feet to the fire. Stephen's all about it. He's not scared at all to play youth, which is great. And obviously he came through that system so he understands how he benefited from that. Um yeah, you take a Will Riley, for instance. I mean, honestly, the last two USL games I watched, Will Riley was the best player on the pitch. Mm-hmm. And he's sixteen years old, turning seventeen. You know, and he's still got a year left with our academy. But to be honest, I don't see him in our academy from now on. I think he should be with USL full time. Frank loves him. The staff of the first team love him. Um, Stephen thinks the world of him. So why would we put him back in the academy full time and just to win games? No, that's not that's not what it's about. We've got to give Will every chance we can to excel and learn from playing against better players. So the USL vehicle has been a huge huge thing for us um, on an individual basis so we can push our top three, four kids into USL who deserve it and you ask when they're ready and sometimes they're not ready Jason, sometimes you don't, if you could wait forever for them to be ready and even I had my doubts about Will going in there as much as he did but he showed us that he was ready with his performance you know, so he's gone from Hey Stephen, let's give Will twenty twenty five minutes to he's first on the team sheet for Stephen, and Stephen's leaving out senior players over to pick Will. So I mean, again, sometimes they're just not ready. They prove to you they're ready with the performance, but it's a huge tool for us to be able to push kids in. I think you'll see some actual younger kids who will be quite a surprise. I think towards hopefully, hopefully, if this thing gets moving again. Right. Towards the end of the season, we'll probably you'll probably see some even younger kids in there again to see if they're ready. I mean, look at Taylor Wolf. He's 2003. Yeah. He was in with the first team all preseason. He actually played in preseason games with the first team. You could look at Taylor and go, oh, he's young, you know. Is he ready for this? You just don't know until you put him in there. And sure enough, he goes in, he does really well. So, again, he's another one. He's a U17 player. Why should we bring him back to the 17s and have him possibly just go through the motions because it's easy for him when he needs a good push and a good kick on to kick him on, you know? That's a really good point. And I think one thing that's common between Will and Tyler, something that's jumped out to me, is their soccer IQ. You know, their their ability to adapt to situations, but they're also just incredibly smart players with their movement on the ball, off the ball. How is that something that you guys really focus on developing, just a soccer IQ as opposed to the, the skill side of it? I think it's something that gets lost here in this country at times. Yeah, um, I'll say this. Both kids are very intelligent off the field, which is a good start. Because, you know, usually a very, very unintelligent soccer player is not usually that good of an intelligent player on the pitch either. Very few and far between. But the fact that they are good scholastically and they're very good academically, um, I think helps them understand the game. They look at the game a different way. They make decisions a different way. But I, I've always said clever boys off the field make good players on the field. And I think that's something that rings true when you look at those two. They're very bright kids off the field. So they absorb everything you give them. They take situations and they learn from those situations. They're not just going through the motions and, like you said, skill acquisition and technical mastery. I think it all it, it's all connected. And the fact that they are very bright individuals helps them as players. And I think, I've said this before, I think about people like Ryan Giggs and, 
players who broke in early in Europe, I think they get the game mentally quicker than most, which is why they get a chance and which is why they can take their chance because they get it mentally and their IQ is high. Now, you ask me, how do you develop IQ? I mean, you can develop IQ with exercises and decision-making exercises and you can also gain a discovery style of coaching, um, self-adaptive style of coaching where you have them make the decisions, where you have them understand what you're trying to do with the principle of play by questioning them and making sure they understand it. That develops a good soccer IQ in a player, um, but it's not easy to deliver always the same way. Um, some coaches struggle with that. Even I did at first, was letting the practice go to the player instead of myself controlling the practice and mandating what was happening. Um, and it's a skill. And it's a it's a quiet skill that you have to practice, but I think that helps players understand the game, which un, which helps their IQ. Does that make sense? Yeah, we we've talked about this before in the guided discovery and and the decision making process and how to foster it. It feels like you know just in, in in my time in the game and around the game that it's a fairly new focus area for coaches in the United States. To, to develop that sense of, like you say, the training session, not controlling it, letting the players run it, and, and knowing when to step in and knowing what questions to ask. Is this something new that you're starting to see across the board, and, and how is it being received across coaches that you talk to? Um, I think I think modern-day coaches now understand the, the reward you get from it and the benefit from it. Um, I think the, you can't lose the the drive and the energy that you have to put into sessions but the approach is very very important if you want to like you said increase increase soccer iq increase their ability to deal with decision making problems that come up you have to give it to them you can't solve it for them you can't give them the answer every time they speak so it's sorry every time they go on the field you can uh you can just give you can't just give them answers. So, right. um, basically, I mean, it's it's yeah. Most people embrace it now, as far as it's a way of improving players mentally, um, soccer IQ, decision making. It helps. It definitely helps, and you definitely see the results. But again, it's not an easy. It's not an easy way to de- to deliver information. You can't just roll the ball up and say, "Okay, guys, solve it." You know, your session has to produce problems for them, for them to solve themselves without, even in non-verbal ways, to be able to solve it with the ball without even asking them questions and communication. Your session has to put forth the barriers for them to break down, which is the difficult part. That's the real challenging part of doing it is, does this session work? Does it Does it present the problems and the constraints that, the players need to get better. It's so interesting to me, like thinking through this, because, you know, I think back and I don't know if you had this experience as a kid playing the game and growing up in the game where it felt the other way. It felt like you were told exactly what to do. And when you look at, you know, most American sports, that's the mentality is the coach is telling the players exactly what to do in a session. And then that's supposed to carry over to the field it's felt like that's been one of the maybe the the hang-ups with American soccer development is that you, know, you had that kind of robotic sense maybe a decade ago where, where players felt like they were trying to replicate a training session as opposed to thinking for themselves on the field. And it sounds like that's starting to change, and it's a, a huge element that maybe other countries have had in the game that we haven't had yet. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when I the way I grew up, we didn't have any coaching until we went to a professional club. So our boys' club was five a side, um, two three days a week, and then two outdoor practices where basically we put down plastic poles for goals, and we played. There was no coaching. Mm-hmm. There was none. So, and you know, I'm talking about the '80s when we're all young kids. Um, 
I joined West Brom, I think, in 1990, and that was the first tactical coaching session I'd ever had. And I was 15, 15 and a half, I think. So yeah, there's something to be said for just letting them play. But again, that's self-adaptive, right? Mm-hmm. With the fact that we were just allowed to play and allowed to discover how to do things made us good players or made some of my teammates very good players. I'm not saying that I was that great. Um, <laughs> Don't sell but... yourself short now. <laughs> Did you see my volley today? I've still got it. Um <laughs> So yeah, it's 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 interesting to look at it, and I still say that to a lot of people I talk to is that in South America and Europe, there's still a lot of free play goes on, where kids get together and just play, you know, street soccer and this and the other, mm-hmm. and there's not a lot of that here, and I think something we've tried to incorporate is to play a lot more small sided games within our sessions, competitive games where we leave it to them to to play the game. You can't structure everything for them. And I think, um, going back to your point, I think one of the problems with this country, maybe, yeah, you're right, 10, 15 years ago, was that we produced amazing athletes who were very good technically because of the style of coaching. Mm -hmm. Because of the style of coaching that was going on in the country, that was what we were kind of trying to produce. Because... It was all about, oh, we need technical players, we need better technical players. But if you overload the technical side, you forget about the IQ, the soccer decisions, the cuteness of the game. And that's where you've got to get the right blend is, yes, you have to have technical mastery, otherwise you can't play. But you've also got to be a smart enough player to get out of situations and deal with situations and work things out on the fly. And if all you get is barked at, and technical, 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 technical that comes to the game, you don't have any ability to solve it. And even now, like if we play Flamengo, if we play at Independiente, uh, Independiente de Val, uh, club, clubs like that, we play at uh, GA Cup, we're nowhere near their IQ. We're nowhere near their cuteness or their game management or anything like that because I think a lot of that comes from their environment and how they play on their own without any structure so it's a it's a very very fine line between are you doing this too much and that too much but again that's where blending self-adaptive exercises with technical mastery with small-sided games with tactical in the periodization of your training and then that's where it all comes together but again it's it's not easy it's far from easy but we've made good strides i think we're on the right track we just need to keep on trying to evolve and stick to one thing for a little while instead of chopping and changing all the time. Yeah, and that's the key because we've seen those approaches change either, you know, depending on who was in charge of the national team or who was in charge of, you know, overall coaching development for the federation. It's felt like whatever the, you know, current fad is, that's what it's turned to. And, you know, you mentioned clubs in South America, for example, it's been fascinating for me to watch the reaction here in Atlanta as a soccer culture is honestly still developing, but you're seeing the reaction to players like Pitti Martinez and Ezequiel Barco and Miguel Almiron and, and the way that they approach the game, which is very different than an American player their age. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's given them someone to look up to. It's given them someone to admire and emulate, and even impersonate. You know, I mean, that's all we did when we were kids was impersonate our national team players or our, for me, it was Newcastle United players. All we did was impersonate them. I ran like Paul Gascoigne for probably two, three years, even though it wasn't a really good running technique. I loved <laughs> the way you... I just wanted to look like Paul Gascoigne. So things like that, you know, the putting players on a pedestal and wanting to be them is where it comes from. And I think if you talk to anybody with a good background in football, they all wanted to be somebody when they were young kids. And I think that's important. It's part of our individual development stuff we're doing now is we align them with a player of their stature and of their um, ability, but on the highest level, like a Sergio Aguero for our number nines, is the A, which Sergio and Joseph are very similar. Right. Um, 
didn't say they were the same player, but they're very similar. Sure. And then our B guy is Lukaku, right? So our number nine, we have guys who are like Lukaku, and we need them to watch him play and emulate what he does, you know? So things like that are important to the game, very important. And then you get the players in the academy now who want to emulate guys that they're watching that aren't too much older than them, like a George Campbell, like a Will Riley, like a George Bellow. Yeah. Is that starting to have an effect on the younger kids in the academy in your mind? Absolutely. For sure. And it's what we've been waiting for, right? I mean, that's what you want. It's I want Garrison Tubbs to be George want to be George Campbell, right? I want the next centre back, Nigel Prince, who's a two thousand and four who's three years away from you know, graduating the academy, I want him to look at George Campbell and say, I want to be him. That's what I want. You know, like a, a little left back on our 2006s, um, Malachi. I want him to emulate George Bellow. That's what I want. And I think that's what we need to, to drive through the academy is, look, here they are. They've been the same position you've been in, and this is what they did to get there. And then there's some aspirational stuff as well, you know. It's exciting to see, and it's exciting to see, you know, Campbell is a prime example of somebody who watched Miles go through it. He's a, a similar kind of player, potentially, and now he's that role model for a Tubbs. Tubbs is that role model for the next one. It's exciting yeah. to see that development happen. Yeah, and it's, it's absolutely required. It needs to be there. And now you've got Parky. Parky's coming back out on a Tuesday night and helping on the 17s back four. And those are things you can't buy. Those are things you can't, you just can't get that anywhere when you've got Michael Parker who's coming back and addressing my two centre backs every week on defending, on positioning, on decision making. You know, and then the Kevin Kratz is trying to get involved a little bit as well. So I think hopefully when Jeff retires when whenever that is he stays with us and gets involved as well he's expressed an interest in the academy too so those are things that we need to get in place as well which are pivotal to player development all that stuff that you know we were all kind of waiting to see how it's evolved it's in that maybe middle phase now where you're starting to get you mentioned Parkhurst and Kratz and, and maybe Lorenowitz and then you know, you've got the young role models for these players. It's it's a really, I think, interesting time to see how things continue to grow. Now, this year has become more interesting than ever before because of this break that we're all dealing with. What advice do you give to coaches out there who are trying to figure out how to keep their progress going with their teams when they can't work with them? Coaches, <clears throat> I would say... Do a lot of self-assessment. Think about things you've done. Think about things you want to do and how you're going to get there. Set yourself some goals. But the biggest piece for me is self-assessment and being really, really honest with yourself. Is Are you doing enough? Are you doing the right things? Are you speaking to enough people? Are you watching enough people? Are you watching content? Um, are you reading are you reading books about coaching, about styles of management? This, I mean, it's not a great time, but it's, it is a great time for you to work on you. And I think the only way we get better players is to get better coaches. And players will develop themselves, but they need guided and they need coaches around them who want to get better themselves. So my biggest, my biggest thing for coaches is do the work. You know, speak to people, read, watch, again, self-analyze what you've done in the past and ask yourself, if, is it really good enough? And did it work? Because winning games doesn't mean it worked. It doesn't mean it worked. It's winning games just meant maybe one player on your team scored a few goals for you and that was it. But is your team doing what you want it to do truthfully, deep down? And if it's not, and work on that. Work on your plan. Work on your principles of play. Work on your style of play. Don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid of someone judging you on because you've changed what you want to do. So I would say take the time to, to make you better and really self-assess what you've done so far in your career and where you want to go. And ask 
for help. I think a lot of coaches think they know it all because they've been in it for 10, 10 years, 15 years. And my thing is, is it one year's experience 15 times or is it 15 years of experience? Mm. And that's the question you've got to ask yourself. So I think there's an opportunity for people to really do something with themselves, you know. Let's take it one step further. We get a lot of parents who, who listen to soccer down here and ask us questions about what they should do with their kids. And normally they have a coach to turn to as well. Well, right now the parent is going to be the one who's there far more than the coach is going to be able to connect with the kids. What advice would you give to parents to keep their kids who are soccer players going right now? Hopefully, um, you know, the, the the kid has a plan from his coach or from his club um, of what to do. And I would say hold your kid accountable. You know, don't let him sit on the couch playing Xbox or playing on the iPad or sitting around all day. Don't let them do that. My biggest thing is get them outside in a space where they can obviously not be close to anybody else, but they can get fresh air, they can work on their skills, they can work on their technique, they can work on their fitness, their strength. But hold them accountable. That would be my to the parents is what I've asked our parents to do. Don't, you know, don't go overboard and have them do this, that, and the other. But I would just hold them accountable to getting outside and keeping themselves active, keeping themselves fit. So when soccer returns, they're ready to go and they can they can work, you know, and a good another one. Make them watch games. If you can, tell them, look, here's a game to watch, watch it with me. You know, if the if the if your coach or your club has not given you ideas just put down pick three moments of the game that were positive and three were that were negative just start to use the time to expand their soccer iq their understanding of the game but a parent's role is support right a parent's role is not a coach although many think they are um <laughs> does happen i'm not insulting anybody when i say that <laughs> no 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 um, but it's the support and it's to hold your kid accountable and, you know, you, your job's to produce good people with good humans and who love the game as well. Um, so, yeah, keep them accountable and don't let them sit about and do nothing is my, my advice. Well, hopefully uh, everybody's going to be able to get back on the field here soon and hopefully – we'll see Atlanta United's Academy continue to develop and continue to send players on. I'm looking forward to seeing these guys with Atlanta United too, and seeing more and more of them with the first team and seeing this job that, that you've done from day one, continue to grow. What's, what's one thing that you are looking to do to take an advantage of this time off the field? What's something you're trying to do to grow? Um, I'm actually looking at our U15 through U19 development plan and just picking it apart, um, looking at our principles that we use, looking at the periodization of the principles to see if they're in line with what we want as a result um, at the end of the day. I'm also watching a lot of games that I didn't get to watch day, day to day in my job. I don't get to watch every single academy game, so I'm watching a lot of games and I'm pulling out individual moments, um, not only for the academy, but for, also for USL. But my biggest plan is to delve into our, our periodization for next year because that's all going to change based on this time off. Um, so I'm trying to refigure the plan and refigure how we're going to get all our principles of play into the, the next period. That's That's my biggest thing. And then obviously talking to guys in Europe, and trying to keep on top of trends and what they're doing with their teams and what's their plan and everything else. So that's where I'm at right now. But there's, I've got so many things that I should be doing, um, which now I've got the time to do. So I've got no excuses. There's some benefits to this slowdown and, and maybe some things like personal development are going to be a part of it. I think it's what a lot of people are, are taking a look at right now and figuring out how they can get better at what they do. And I'm sure it's something that, that you and your staff is doing as well. Yeah. I mean, maybe not even in sports, you know, mm -hmm. it's a good time to reflect on just society as a whole. I think where we were heading and where it was going. I think a lot of people will come out of this with a little bit of a different viewpoint. Not everybody, 
But I think a lot of people will do a lot of soul searching and a lot of, like I said, self analysis of who they are as a person too, you know? So even though it's a, a curse, it could also be a blessing. Well, I hope next time that we're talking, it'll be after a game or, or at Fifth Third Bank Stadium after a twos game, talking about one of the academy players. But I do appreciate the time and kind of going in depth on a lot of different things. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate it. No, man, I enjoyed it. Thanks for uh, letting me talk football for an hour instead of my being four-year-old. <laughs> Always a good break when we can do it. So Absolutely. thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, make sure you're following us at Soccer Down here and all your social media channels, and we'll be back with more 1v1 very soon.